All right. Okay, so before we get started, I would just want to remind you it's ethical decision making in the digital world. What does that look like, especially in the in the area of data privacy and cyber security? We have Nelson Curry here with us. I'll be inviting him shortly, but before we go into that, there's a couple of things that need to happen. We want to start off with prayer. And if you don't mind, Maureen, you could unmute your mic or switch on the video if you can. And please get us started with prayer. Maureen Mutinda, if you if you don't mind. Yes, there you are. Good to see you, Maureen. Good to see you, too, Sam. Thank you. Very okay, good. let's uh, let's uh, let's let's start with our prayer. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we come before you this morning with thanksgiving in our hearts. We want to thank you for the gift of life. We want to thank you for the gift of uh, good health. We want to thank you, Father, for this session, which is we are about to start. So we thank you for our customers for always joining us, and we thank you for our partners and as a, and the bank as a whole. For always supporting this uh, initiative lord we thank you and we uh, want to dedicate this webinar before you that lord each and everything that you're going to learn today you're going to make it uh, fruitful for our businesses and for our work it is in jesus name we pray and believe amen amen thank you very much maureen that's a powerful prayer i know i selected the right person and the bible says prayer of a righteous woman Availeth much, so thank you. <laughs> okay, type thank amen you, in the chat. <laughs> type, type amen in the chat. Ah, Nelson, you're giving away my intro. Nelson, you're giving away my intro. Nelson, Nelson, I'm going to ask you to stay off of video for now. You're giving away my intro. I had a lot of work put into this intro. Fast wait, fast wait. As you can tell, our guest is excited to be back. And I'm going to ask him to fast wait because I want to go through a bit of a welcome note. Let me walk you through what we're going to have. And then I'll have him back shortly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nelson. So we're going to have a welcome note. Uh, we're going to hear a bit about COP, especially for those who are here for the first time. And then I will be telling you about AMI for those who may not already know. And then we'll get into this fireside chat with Nelson Curry, who is brilliant. He's been here before. He was here about two weeks ago. And we're talking about very specific Tech related aspects, and we're going to come back to that, except now we're widening it to legal and also tech. So, how do those come together? Well, he is the bridge. He is the bridge between those two worlds, and, and you're going to find out soon why he is that person. So, we'll have a question and answer session after that. If you have questions, remember as soon as you get the question, put it in the QA so that you don't forget it, but also so that we don't forget to come back to that question to get you the answer you're looking for. And then after that, we'll wrap it up. We'll hear a bit from Popa. And then we'll call it a session. So 11, 12, 30, and we'll be done. We'll allow you to get back to your business. But we trust that this time is not time wasted. It's time invested, right? Now, without any further ado, I want to invite Mr. Mwakisha uh, from CoBank, the CoBank family. It's going to be giving us our welcome note. And Maureen will also chime in about some of the aspects that we need to be reminded about. Mr. Mwakisha, you're welcome. Very well. Very well, Mr. Kimera and... Uh... Many thanks and good morning to all our esteemed customers and who have actually joined us this morning for our MSME webinar. If you are joining us from your office, be it your shop, in your car, or even your house, Karibu Sana. My name is Ferdinand Mwakisha, supporting Asset Finance and IPF. I'm stepping in for my colleague Peter Ndomia, who is currently attending other official assignments. Kimera, as CoBank and our customers, as CoBank, we are super grateful to have you every Thursday in our webinars and will continue to handhold you and offer the required financial support in terms of trainings and insights aimed at propelling your business to the next level. So on standby is uh, my colleague, Maureen Mutinda, ready to highlight the CoBank MSME offering for our customers. And uh, without uh, much ado, I wish now to officially welcome my colleague Maureen Mutinda to take it up. Maureen, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Makisha, for that uh, wonderful welcome. Uh, my name is Maureen Mutinda. 
I'm a relationship manager, SME oh, bossing at Cooperative Bank. No, 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 not now. Sorry for that. Um, I'm an RM, uh, SME banking. So I'm here to just uh, take you through a few items that um, we feel that uh, you've always supported us on and we'll also feel uh, grateful to keep supporting you and uh, MSMEs. Uh, just to start us off, uh, Sam, I would like to let my uh, or the Cop Bank customers uh, know that last week we were in India. We went to receive a trophy on the on a gold uh, award on SME, the best SME financial Africa, twenty twenty three. Uh, we are very grateful because that is the support that our customers are giving us. We cannot do it alone. Uh, we can have the products but uh, we cannot succeed if our customers do not take up those products. So just to jumping into what I'm about to present as uh, projected on your screens, mm -hmm. we have uh, three, three, we have identified our customer needs and classified them into three. Uh, that is the transactional, then there's lending, and then there's the payment solutions. I hope uh, I can be heard clearly. Yes, um, you can. Okay, okay. Yeah, so we have the transactional, we have lending, and we have the payments. That's the payment, the collection solution. So I'll just uh, uh, explain each uh, briefly. On Under transactional solutions, we've classified our customers to bronze, silver, and gold. So depending on the stage that your business is in, uh, is it a, a startup or is it a micro business, we classify you under bronze. If you are a small enterprise, we classify you under silver package. And if you are uh, medium enterprises, then we classify you under gold package. So uh, these accounts, uh, these are our main classification for MSME. So we walk into any branch, uh, depending on uh, which stage your business is in, we are able to open for you an account under those packages. And under those packages, you're able to also access our lending solutions. Lending solutions uh, will include our unsecured loans. We have the, just a minute. We have the unsecured uh, term loans. We have the unsecured overdrafts. We have the secured term loans, mobile business loans, where you're able to access just at the comfort of your home. We have the asset financing where we can finance you for private and even for business. That is, um, we are financing school buses, we are financing the matatus, we are financing the 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 private vehicles, uh, and 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 many more. We also have the mortgage where we are financing both residential and commercial, and then finally we have the trade finance solution. We have a whole basket of uh, lending solutions for you. So whichever the need you have under lending, we are able to support you. And then lastly, but not the least, we have the payment or the collection solutions where we support you in the collection of uh, your finances, uh, your sales. We have the MCOP cash. Uh, we have the COP till. That th this is a till like any other where payment is made and then it's terminated direct to your COP bank account. And then we have the M collection where this this uh, mostly we give to maybe people who have rentals, people who are in chamas, because you're able to make deposits to a common account with uh, some narrations, mm -hmm. uh, with an identifier, maybe an ID number or your name, you're able to separate those finances. And then, then there's the new COP online, which is which allows you to make payments, uh, utility bills, mm -hmm. payments through suppliers, uh, international transfers, so on and so forth. And then we have the COP Kwajirani agents. This is where we have uh, a number of agents uh, near your homes, your businesses, where you're able to. We have brought banking near to you so that uh, you're able to uh, make uh, your banking transactions uh, conveniently without uh, walking to a branch. Then we have the POS merchants where customers can make payments in your businesses uh, and then the money 
terminate to your co bank account in the shortest, the shortest time possible. Then we have the Lipa and Impesa termination where we've partnered with uh, Safaricom. Instead of you getting a direct, a direct uh, Lipa and Impesa from Safaricom, we are able to request it for you through Cop Bank, and we are able also to join the same with your Cop Bank account, such that any payment that is made in your business it terminates to the bank account, which comes with security. There is no reversals. We know customers have been suffering with people purchasing uh, goods from their businesses and reversing them back to to, to their empresas. And then lastly, we have e-commerce where we, uh, we we are we are offering to our digital customers who, those who are selling uh, products online where they are able to receive payments through the e-commerce so uh like i've said we have a basket of products that we are offering to our msme customers what you need to do is just get in touch with us so walk to our nearest branch we have a wide network uh, of branches uh i'm sure near every business there is an accessible branch so kindly just get, uh, go in there and you'll find um, relationship officers you'll find service service desk uh, managers and officers who are willing to open these accounts and also offer these loan solutions to you. So kindly um, get, get in touch with us. Let's continue supporting each other. It's a mutual relationship, yeah? And we want to continue being the financier for uh, SMEs in Africa. And we cannot do this alone, kindly continue supporting us. Thank you very much and back to you, Sam. Thank you so much. Three key business needs that COP responds to, so transaction solutions, learning solutions and payment solutions. Thank you very much, Maureen. I hope that we'll be hearing from you a little bit later. So if you have a question yes. uh, regarding COP, please put it in the chat. Maureen and Mr. Makisha Ferdinand will be responding to that uh, shortly. Thank you so much. So that's from the COP side. I also want to remind you a bit about AMI. AMI is all about enabling ambitious businesses across Africa to thrive. Very simply, we're here to help you move to the next level. How do we do that? We do that through digital platforms, especially, and we're passionate about reaching lots of people like you. So we do that through uh, digital platforms. We've reached close to 40 countries across the continent. Thousands of people train content in five languages, lots of tools. Tools are very core, core for us because we believe that entrepreneur doesn't need further conversation and theory. They need a tool. If you want to increase your sales, you need a tool. If you want to understand about legal aspects, you need a tool to help you to do that. And that's what we are keen on providing. So in all our programs, that's something that you will see in our continual interaction. If you want to find out more, of course, go to africanmanagers.org. Now, that's that. I want us to go ahead and get into our conversation today. Today, we have Nelson Nkari, who is our founder and CEO, Legal Technologies Kenya. But there's something really interesting about Nelson, even as I was doing a bit of my research. So most people... And this is my intro before Nelson, you come on. I know Nelson was excited. He was here two weeks ago and he's keen to jump into, he's that guy. He wants to move. Okay, he's always on the move. Um, The thing I found out about Nelson is that for most of us, you know, there are two kinds of people. There are those who are either or, they, cho they choose from the options on the table, either or, and they'll pick. Then there are those who say, no, why is it either or? I can take both and I can take more. So Nelson is one of those people. Instead of picking one thing, instead of picking one field to concentrate on, he's like, no, 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 no. I'm the kind of person who has the capacity to go into two different fields and even do more. So he's been he's, in, he's a consultant in, in both fields, in engineering, software engineering in the tech world. He's also very present in the law side of things, and it's quite fantastic. He possesses over five years of experience in both the legal practice and the software engineering. So obviously he is multidisciplinary in that sense. But even when he came to starting businesses, he decided to found two companies. One is called, is he is the founder and CEO of Legal Technologies Kenya Limited, where together with his team, they're all about developing software applications for uh, the legal sector. But also he decided to found and is the managing partner of Nelson Curry and company Advocates a tech-enabled law firm that specializes in providing tailored legal services to the technology sector. So he chooses to serve two people and way more. 
So he's that kind of person, and we're excited to have him here. Why are we excited to have him here? Well, because you may have questions, you may have concerns, you may see where technology is going, and you're wondering, how is the new technology going to affect my business? How do I receive legal services? So in both these fields, we have found the bridge. So if you have any questions, any concerns, if you're wondering about impact, how do I access legal services as the, as the times change? Well, you are in the right place, and we have the right guest. Ladies and gentlemen, help me use your emojis or your claps, or whatever you can. Welcome back once again from two weeks ago, Nelson and Kari, founder and CEO, Legal Technologies Kenya. Round of applause, please. Nelson, uh -huh. now you can switch on your video. <laughs> Fantastic. Let me see, Nelson. Oh, wait, is Nelson here? Nelson, Nelson. Yes, there you are. See, see, that's like, yeah. We want to welcome you back in your in your in your weight, sir. <laughs> yeah, we want to welcome you back in your in your in your weight, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Nelson, what have you been up to in the last two weeks, man? Um, hi Sam, can you hear me? Nelson, what have you been I up can't, to in the last two weeks? I, I can't, but I think there's a major delay between here and there, so I can hear myself back. I can't. I, I can't, but I think there's a major delay between here and so I can hear myself. Yeah, I think uh, there might be a slight delay. I'm not sure if it's from my end or from your end. Let's see. Are you using uh, uh, earphones? Because if you're using two devices, that may be an effect. Are you using uh, uh, earphones? Because if you're using two devices, that may be an effect. Yeah, okay. Just give me a minute to sort it out and yep. then we can get started. No problem. No problem. No problem. In the meantime, maybe I'll take the minute uh, as uh, Nelson helps us to sort that out. I want to remind you of some of the highlights that we picked up from the last time he was with us. And uh, last time, uh, Fiona Maina, who is here. Fiona, would you say a quick hello? Just, just you can just use your voice and just say a quick hello because I know you're always behind the scenes, but I'm always keen to highlight you. Yes, this is Fiona. Hi, Sam. Um, yes, I am here. The last time, uh, sorry, uh, the last time I was on the session with Nelson, uh, you were you were held up somewhere else, but we had a really a fantastic time. Um, we got yeah. to pick his brain on matters, of course, legal and technology and where they intersect. And so I'm really excited again for this session. Very brilliant, very brilliant. And last time we were looking at, um, if I'm not wrong, we were looking at, um, ah, sorry, I, might, I just got a brain freeze. Please remind me. Uh, oh, my, my, Fiona, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> you're on mute, Fiona. <laughs> yes, I would mute. I'm sorry about that. Um, yes. So um the last time we were uh we were with Nelson, we were speaking about um again um digital innovation. Intellectual property. And what, yes, yes, and intellectual digital, property. Yes, 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 yes. yes. So yes. um and and legal implications around um innovation and intellectual property rights and we covered a lot of things like copyright uh we covered things like trademark and it was very interesting and and the audience was quite engaged because um they all had questions about products they're creating and softwares they're building and it was it was very interactive and very and it was brilliant honestly Sam. yeah yeah, yeah fantastic yeah. i know some and, other kids yeah sorry go ahead yeah, and and I was just going to say that um, perhaps Nelson is one of the luckiest um, guests as, <laughs> on 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 our webinars because he's gotten to have a discussion with me, and then now he's also having a discussion with you. So yeah. Ah, well, thank you. Well, I'm definitely, yeah. I'm 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 definitely honored. I'm definitely honored, and I'm so glad that we could have Nelson uh, back with us. Nelson, welcome yeah. back again. Let's see, is it working, Nelson? I hope so. Yes, yes. Yeah. I don't know what you did, but <laughs> yeah, clearly okay. we now know you why you are in the tech uh, tech world. Just like that, you fixed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you for your. Okay, great. So I'll let you take over, Sam. Yeah. 
Sure thing. Nelson, I wanted to ask, what have you been up to in the last uh, two or so weeks? What What's what's on top of mind for you? Uh, just continuing to work, uh, continuing to push. Uh, we handle so many projects uh, from both sides, the law firm and uh, the legal tech company. So basically just work all around. And of course, uh, you have to get the perfect uh, balance of work and life. So a few breaks here and there as well. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm curious, if I may, I know you may have already dealt with this question the last time you were here. How are you able mm -hmm. to run two seemingly, like most of us don't naturally think law and technology come together. It's more of like uh, they clash sometimes. You know, the legal side is coming against the innovation and, and all these uh, things that tech is bringing in. Now we're talking about AI and disrupting and the legal side is trying to mitigate but you have a way of bringing everything together like a bridge. How does that come together for you, running two companies and, and doing these two specific things? I think um, where we are at in terms of the tech revolution, um, there's nothing, there's no industry that isn't affected by tech, including ours, the legal sector. And so the thing yeah. is, if, if you're not adapting, if you're not um, embracing technology, you're going to fall behind both in terms of um, the benefits that you essentially should reap from technology and also from your competitiveness in the space. So um, most of what I do is, is related, uh, both on the, legal, uh, on the legal tech side and on the law firm side. So whether it's consulting with law and technology, whether it's building software applications, um, Everything I do touches on both both in on both worlds. So it's not really complicated in terms of having to run both companies. Well, um, I know I would typically save this for the last question, but I want to just flip things around and start with it. And it's really li linked with uh, an article, the latest article on uh, I was looking at your LinkedIn, Nelson Curry and Co. Advocates. So the last article yeah. was really interesting. It it was talking about how uh, your last article was talking about how legal tech is being used to redefine the role of, and perception of legal services in business. What does yes. that look like, and what does that mean for the people in the room right now? So small businesses, medium sized businesses. What does that look like? Yeah. So um, we've been talking about this tech revolution not only in the legal space but in all aspects of business for a very long time. But um, something that is quite unique to our industry, that is the legal sector, is that there really has been a lot of, uh, we've been dragging our feet basically in terms of uh, embracing technology and significantly changing how we do business. And because of this, for the longest time, um, the legal departments and legal service providers have been seen as a cost center. What we mean by cost center is that we consume more resources than we generate revenue. And that has been the perception for a very long time because of the way we've been doing business, which is reactive in nature. By reactive, I mean that we are only called upon when something goes wrong. But um, with the advent of technology, technology is giving us a lot of benefits. It's automating a lot of uh, our work processes. Uh, it's allowing us to be able to forecast, that is through data analytics and artificial intelligence and machine learning. We are able to forecast perhaps what is going to happen. Uh, we are able to uh, predict the sectors that are going to do well and the sectors that are not going to do well. And so we are able to direct businesses on what to do and what not to do in a better manner, making us more proactive than reactive. And what this translates into is that we are able to become a profit center and not a cost center. So if we can uh, tell businesses, uh, this is potentially a, going to be a problem for you two or three years down the line in terms of it's going to perhaps lead to mitigation or it's going to lead to maybe uh, fines from maybe a compliance authority. Maybe you haven't complied, let's say, for example, with the data protection regulations, which is our discussion today. And we're able to tell you that this is going to be a problem in the future and you're able to take actions to mitigate these potential problems in, in the future. And so uh, by embracing technology, we become a profit center. So we are no longer uh, reacting and uh, or coming on board once a problem occurs, but we're telling you to anticipate this or to act in such a way as to bring about profits from the legal side. 
in what, so it does make it really specific for me. What would that mean if I'm here and I'm running a fairly smaller business? I sometimes we we relegate this to like the larger corps and say, ah, that's for those guys. But as a small business, what does that mean for me? What can I do? How can I position myself for that? You see, the good thing with uh, technology nowadays is that access is very, uh, it's much cheaper and, and it's yeah. very, I would say, universal. So, um, especially with cloud computing, even small companies are able to afford uh, resources that traditionally they wouldn't be able to. And so what this means is that um, all these technologies that we're talking about, uh, that is artificial intelligence, machine learning, or even technologies on the legal side, that is uh, things like uh, contract management, uh, document automation, and the rest, essentially, all the technologies that we use uh, as lawyers to automate and to increase efficiency in our work are available even to small and medium enterprises at relatively low costs. And so um, traditionally cost, used to, cost and technology used to be the limiting factor, but we have essentially eliminated those. And so even small companies are able to come to us tech enabled lawyers and to tell us, uh, this is my business. Can you please design a legal processes and workflows that involve technology around my business processes? And we can design uh, legal, sorry, uh, legal processes for you that incorporate technology and you can reap all these benefits and essentially transform um, your legal department, whether it's in-house or outsourced into a profit center as I had described before. Well, all right, so let's jump into today's discussion. Today we're talking about ethical decision-making in a digital world. How do we navigate, especially the aspects of digital privacy and the cybersecurity? Please give us an introduction because it feels like an oxymoron to say ethical decision-making and then say digital world. Because now if we're relying on, does that mean we're relying on machines to make decisions for us? Everything is powered by an algorithm, connected devices. What does that look like? Please help us understand generally what does that look like as a theme? Yeah, so um, I think in this day and age, the story of uh, digital transformation of the digital world cannot be told without um, the COVID nineteen pandemic. We know that yeah. it was the biggest, yeah, it was the biggest accelerant uh, for digitization in, in, in essentially all sectors, all business sectors. And so what we've seen is a proliferation of virtual workspaces, uh, video conferencing applications project management software, and so on and so forth. So essentially, all these things have been targeted at maintaining productivity in communication and ensuring that um, we are able to work remotely while still maintaining the levels of productivity and communication that we were experiencing and working um, physically. And so because of this, we see that the digital landscape is highly competitive. We've seen so many startups and tech giants consistently innovating. And um, essentially, companies that stay agile and adaptive are able to seize opportunities and respond to the evolving market dynamics. So the market has pushed us to uh, digitization. We have seen a rise of uh, e-commerce. And nowadays, companies are investing in online sales channels and digital marketing, uh, supply chain automation, and staying competitive, not just within their markets, but globally. That is what digitization has done for us. It has made, you know, we used to have this phrase that um, the world is, is now a global village or something of the sort, and really digitization of the internet is what has made this uh, entirely possible. But uh, I would say COVID-19 COVID was the inflection point that forced us uh, to change, including us who are a bit uh, resistant. That, by us, I mean us in the legal sector. Nowadays, you either change and adapt or you die. And uh, really, that is what digitization has become for us. And uh, with this digitization, something that has become central to, to, uh, to this era of digitization, which now we call the fourth industrial revolution, is data, data and analytics. So uh, because of the different ways in which uh, organizations are operating through digital platforms, they are able to accumulate vast amounts of data from different sources. This could be customer interactions. Um, we have Internet of Things devices. Um, I don't know if you're aware of that or if I need to perhaps give an explanation. Um, you could touch a little bit on it so that uh, none of us is left behind. 
Yeah, so uh, what we mean by Internet of Things devices, um, these are devices that are connected through the internet. And uh, yeah. we do provide some kind of um, automation and levels of control that allow you to interact with devices that you traditionally wouldn't be able to interact with through the internet. An example of this, we have what we call smart fridges. So smart fridges are connected to the internet and then for some you, do, you get an app on your phone. So for example, if uh, my fridge tells me, my smart fridge tells me that uh, I am running low on orange juice, it's able to give me an option to uh, send an order to my local supermarket for orange juice. I just click a button on, on my app. Uh, the fridge sends the request to my local supermarket. Uh, since my card is already loaded on the application, uh, the supermarket is able to charge me and have those goods delivered directly to my household. So that's what we mean by the interconnectivity of devices or IoT devices. So that will be uh, smart watches, smart watches, exactly. smart TV, smart anything really where the internet is based on your pattern. It's telling you what you're missing and then you can maybe just decide on the final thing, but all the recommendations are coming through from technology. Yes, exactly. Okay. And so um, another source of data for organizations is, is also social media. Uh, we interact a lot with uh, organizations on social media and depending on the terms of use of each social media platform, organizations are able to collect data uh, related to you. And so uh, this data has become a central driving force in the digitization of almost every aspect of modern life. And uh, this digitization is being driven by artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms. Uh, so when we collect vast amounts of data uh, and we run them through AI and machine learning algorithms, they are able to glean insights. So uh, the data is able to tell organizations who you are, what your preferences are, and um, how to customize whatever service offerings they have to fit your needs. And so um, using the insights that they gain, then they're able to improve their business model and to offer you a better product. That being said, because of the large amounts of data that are being collected, there are a lot of ethical concerns that uh, come with this. I think that's the next part of this question. Yes, that's, I was actually, yeah, that's where I was going because if you think about it, and for those who are just joining us, we're having a full discussion, a conversation with Nelson Ankari, who is going to be speaking to us about ethical decision-making in a digital world, navigating especially data privacy and cybersecurity. Well, we've just stumbled in, we've just covered the introduction, what generally this looks like, and we're getting into the tension of, okay, so there's a lot of data, machines are telling me what to do, or applications, if you will, what's the ethical line there? If you have a question at any point, and what does this mean for your business, Put it in the Q&A. We're going to continue this discussion for the next uh, maybe 25 or 20 minutes. 20 minutes, and then we'll get into some of your questions, and hopefully we can respond a little bit. But just to set up the next question, for those who maybe just joined, we are talking about uh, dig uh, ethics and also at the same time digitalization. For context, this is all about decision making. So we're hearing words like data analytics, uh, data science, that kind of language. We are hearing that we have connected devices. All of us, more than half the world is connected on the internet. How do you receive your information? How do you receive your health? How do you receive your payments? All those things, all that information is somewhere online. And we have machines that are advising us on what we need to be doing. So we are really um, heavily influenced by those kinds of uh, scenarios in terms of AI. What does that mean in terms of ethics, Nelson? Yeah, so um, when we talk about AI and machine learning and the process of um, getting these insights, or the processes that company have, companies have to go through to get these insights, it involves a lot of data, like vast amounts of data. And um, we've, we've seen, uh, essentially, if you follow um, cases from different jurisdictions, especially in Europe and in the United States, where big tech really um, is very entrenched, you will see a lot of questions about how much data these companies are collecting about you and how they use this data. Uh, and also, uh, for example, uh, if I was to ask a question, um, what does Google do or what does Facebook do? 
most people, or even a company like Tesla, most people will think that Tesla is a car manufacturer, but Tesla is a data company because of the nature of uh, the interconnectedness of even the cars in manufacture. They collect vast amounts of data about you, and all these companies have relationships where they sell data to each other. So essentially, almost all of big tech uh, is operating right now as a data company, and it's the most profitable venture. And because of that, there are so many concerns about how much data these companies are collecting about you, the security of the data they collect about you, and the people that they sell this data, this data to, and um, how much knowledge you have about um, you, how much data is being collected about you and what it is being used for. And so the first thing that we have to look at is consent. When we talk about consent, consent has to be informed. So um, any measures, any company that is collecting data about you has to tell you we are collecting data about you, and this is what you're going to use it for. This is how we're going to store it, and these are the options available to you. So that when I say yes, I allow you to collect my data, I have all the facts uh, about exactly what is going to happen to uh, the personal data that you have collected from me. And where consent is not informed, in most jurisdictions, including Kenya, that is a violation of your data privacy rights. And you, uh, there are various causes of, of action available to you uh, in terms of seeking remedies where uh, your consent is not informed. Then uh, the next thing we have to look at is transparency. So organizations are required to be transparent about their data practices. So uh, where an organization is collecting your data, there's a requirement for them to tell you about their privacy policies. So what is the internal policy about um, how we are collecting your data, how we are going to use it, and how we are going to protect it? Um, are these policies given to you in an easy to understand uh, format? Are they explained to you in a way that you can understand? Or did they come to a lawyer like me who's going to put it in a lot of legal jargon that you don't understand, essentially just to trick you? So uh, the, the point here is that it has to be transparent. And when it is not transparent, this is also a violation of data privacy rights. Then uh, there is also a requirement for uh, data minimization and purpose limitation. What we mean by that is that um, you are not uh, allowed to collect as much data as, as you want. No, you're only allowed to collect what is necessary uh, because when let's say I collect Nelson, all the data, Nelson, that sounds like uh that sounds like a legal trick. What what is necessary? I, I, I'm getting to that, and that's that is what we call a <laughs> Ah, okay. So yes, uh, if I am collecting data about you, let's say uh, my company is an e-commerce website, yeah. I do not need, for example, to collect your national identification number. Because for what purpose do I need that as an e-commerce company? Perhaps what I need from you is your mobile phone number, an email address, and a delivery location. So any information that is not necessary or uh, critical to the business that we are conducting should not be collected. And that is what we mean by data minimization and purpose limitation. Purpose limitation means that um, I should strictly use the data, the data I have collected for the purpose for which it is stated. So if let's say I collect um, your delivery address as an e-commerce company, I am only allowed to use that information when uh, uh, fulfilling an order uh, and delivering it to your address. So I am not allowed to use it for any other purpose than what it is stated. Yes, and then um, we also have anonymization and de-identification. So uh, we are also required to take uh, the necessary steps to de-anonymize our data. This is um, a step that is usually taken to, in, in anticipation or rather of any potential data breaches, so that whenever an incident occurs, the data has been de-anonymized and be identified enough that you're not at risk. So whatever data I have collected about you, in as much as internally we know that, let's say it's about some, Anyone yeah. who is not uh, internal to a company is not able to tell which sum this is, or is not even able to tell that this is about sum. That is what we mean by anonymization and de-identification. Then we also have right to access and erasure. Uh, this is also a requirement in almost all jurisdictions, including Kenya. So when I have collected data about you, 
And for, for instance, let's go back to the e-commerce uh, website. They have collected my data, um, they have fulfilled my order, and I feel that I no longer need them to have this data, uh, this personal data of mine. It is a right that you have to ask them to delete this data uh, that they have about you. And uh, they are not allowed to say no. <laughs> It's a requirement by law that whenever I ask for my data to be deleted or whenever I ask for my data to be sent to me, they have to do that. Then um, it is also, and part of the ethical concerns is also uh, security safeguards. You have to demonstrate that um, you have put in place enough security measures to ensure that you are preventing uh, data breaches and unauthorized access yeah. to the data that you have collected. And finally, and perhaps the most important, is uh, children's privacy. And this is a very sensitive issue. And it's something I think that uh, we have failed, especially with regards to social media. Uh, really, we have failed a lot in terms of ensuring uh, the privacy of children on especially social media pl platforms. But it's one of the biggest ethical concerns that we have about uh, data privacy and the collection of data. So special care needs really needs to be taken in collecting and processing data from children. And there has to be informed consent from their guardians or their parents whenever you're collecting data from children. I'm curious to move you to bias. So the whole point of this is that we're using, it's about decision-making. Long ago, we used to rely more on social circles. So you get advice, you get that, you know, that kind of thing. And then we moved to media. So 150 years ago, until even some of the influence today, you read the news to find your decision. You, you see what someone is blogging about, then you make your decision. But now the future seems to be, and what you're telling us is that all of our devices are connected and we have AI, artificial intelligence, suggesting and making recommendations about our choices. And we find that in our health, we find that in our travel we find that well now people are meeting and they are getting married so that may ai may also be determining who you get married to and for our children i imagine that will be even crazier i'm concerned about the question of bias especially when we talk about data privacy and so on when the machine is making a recommendation how do we mitigate bias so this uh, is a challenge for um the businesses or organizations that are involved in uh, the processes of creating the algorithms. So algorithms are trained on uh, vast amounts of data. So um, there is usually, there are two levels of bias. There's machine bias and there's, uh, uh, let me call it the program bias, the person who is training uh, the algorithm. So if the person who is training the algorithm has some inherent biases, and this usually comes in a lot, uh, especially with issues of race and ethnicity, uh, right. this bias is obviously going to, trans to be translated into the machine because uh, more often than not, the machine or rather the code reflects uh, the person who is writing the code. And another level of bias we have is, is a machine bias. So when the machine is trained on data that is inherently biased, uh, perhaps a good example of this would be on uh, policing in the United States. So we know yes. about the issues of racism that we have in the United States. So uh, people yeah. who've been developing um, AI and machine learning algorithms to deal with predictive policing have encountered issues of racial bias because the data that they've collected from the policing institutions in that country has shown, uh, or rather is, 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 is wrought with a lot of racial bias. And this bias then is translated into the machine learning algorithms. So uh, the cure here is to first of all ensure that the data that we're feeding into these machines when we're training them is free from any bias. So this means um, human actors like myself and yourself, human actors who would ordinarily be uh, the victims of bias to come in and to help uh, the organization identify biases in the data and to clean out this bias from the data so that we are training the machine with data that is not biased. And if you train the machine and you see that it's exhibiting a, a, a certain kind of bias, then it means you have to go back to uh, the drawing board, identify uh, where this bias is coming from and try and eliminate that bias in, in the data. Because uh, the risk here is that if we do not eliminate, uh, if we do not eliminate even the slightest form of bias, it's going to be compounded. 
yeah. because the machine is continuously learning from uh, gathering even more data from uh, from the internet or from different sources and so on. When you do not eliminate bias, it's compounded and the machine becomes progressively worse. Right, so the bias just continues to become constantly worse. Now, it's interesting. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the, the concern around, like, for instance, the ratio activity where they found, I think in one research, they found a computer program that was recommending in the justice system, interestingly, so I thought to ask you about that. The the computer, the the, AL, the machine learning that we're working with was recommending that black people two times more likely to repeat a crime, even if over time it was found to be wrong. But now some of us may feel like, okay, that's a bit far off. We are in Kenya, like, I don't know, It's maybe it's not yet that bad. But I was thinking of it in terms of management practices like recruiting, because even in Kenya, we're already using AI to sort out uh, maybe the first thousand and you only want to deal with the last 20. So if the machine is already having biases, you know, for instance, for those who may be wondering what we're talking about, if a machine is taught that, for instance, um, people who grow up in uh, in, uh, in scenarios where they have both parents are more reliable or more stable, then that means those, is that a formula to use to hire so that you, <laughs> you have those people to cure your employee turnover situation, how does that work? Especially now, please bring it to like Kenya here, what do we do? Is that happening? How do we mitigate? Yeah, I, it's, it's definitely happening. And um, you know, the cure really is, is the same for every situation. It goes back to the data because uh, the machine is only as good as the data that it's trained on. So um, I know it's the, the easy way out is usually, because uh, I know what a lot of companies do is we write algorithms, they go to the specific sources that we want them to get this data and they, they harvest the data uh, in bulk. And for most companies, yeah. that's usually enough for them to start the training operations. And that is where we go wrong because uh, this data has not been cured of any bias that is inherent in that data. And because we collect from so many uh, sources that sometimes may look legitimate, but they are not, I know we are aware of how many uh, different lobby groups we have for different special interests. And so it's really difficult to ascertain uh, the veracity of a lot of the data that we're collecting. And these shortcuts that we take, uh, especially when mining data and then going straight ahead to training the algorithm is what leads to these uh, levels of bias. So, uh, and I understand that sometimes there are cost limitations for businesses, especially when dealing with SMEs uh, in the development processes of AI and machine learning and those things. Um, there are challenges that comes with, uh, with costs because there's a lot of manpower that is required to sift through the thousands and thousands of gigabytes of data that, that we need to train uh, the AI models. So perhaps what we can do is to modularize Whenever we are um, collecting data from different sources, uh, we can categorize and modularize it so that it's, it's, it's much more easier to go through each different data set before combining them into uh, one whole data set that is going to change the algorithm. And so we need a lot of manpower to, especially for communities that are at risk of being uh, affected negatively by the bias. So if, for example, we're saying that people from low-income areas have a certain uh, undesirable characteristic about them, these are people who are going to get affected. And so these are the people yeah. that we need to bring on board to tell us this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is, but this is what is correct. So there's really no other way around it at present, but we just have to in, involve a lot of the vulnerable communities that will be the victims of this bias. I'm curious, though, isn't that... I mean, in the legal aspect, isn't that someone, some, doesn't someone hope to benefit from that from the marketing standpoint? Because then you can teach the algorithm to recommend your business and then you push that. That's how sales happen. How, how, we, how are we handling that? Sorry, I, I didn't quite get that. No, I'm saying uh, because we are, we are relying on the algorithm and how the machine is learning, I imagine it's useful to a particular individual, for instance, if it comes to recommendation of, uh, for instance, if it's a banking system, wouldn't it be in someone's interest to, to recommend their particular bank or their brand or 
or they are, you know, just whatever product they are serving? Yeah, I guess it's 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 in it's in their interest, but uh, you know this this can be cured through regulation. So okay. and that is what okay. uh, yes, that that is the purpose of, of, of the government coming in through regulation. If we leave some of these things, especially emerging technologies, to self-regulation, uh, companies are going to take shortcuts because it's 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 more much more profitable to take a shortcut because uh, not taking a shortcut means you're going to incur a lot of costs. So regulation should uh, should be able to cure a lot of those uh, malpractices that may come in uh, when when we decide that uh, I want to use this uh, uh, this system or this algorithm to achieve a certain benefit. Please tell me more about um, regulation, especially government regulation, and also maybe how the government regulation can help us here as uh, small and medium sized businesses. Yeah, so um, specifically touching data privacy, we have the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner in Kenya, and this is the regulating authority um, handling matters on, on data privacy. And so we have an act of parliament uh, that was enacted in 2019 to regulate uh, data privacy and security. And it's very comprehensive and very forward thinking. We, we adopted it from the general data protection regulation of the European Union. The EU was the first to really uh, come up with a comprehensive set of regulations on, on, on data protection and security. And, and it's really very forward thinking and very, um, it's very better. Rather, let me say, it's very centered on the individual. So it's very protective of you as an individual and your rights to data privacy. And that is the same model that we have adopted in Kenya. And it's it's really a very commendable step by the government of Kenya. And um, we have also have what we call subsidiary uh, legislation. Subsidiary legislation is now what we term as regulations. So these are what uh, I used to guide companies on uh, how they should um, be in conformity with the act. So uh, for example, there are a couple of requirements. If you process personal data, you are required to register with the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. So personal data is anything that can be used to identify me as an individual. It could be my name, it could be my image or likeness, it could be my national ID number, it could be my mobile phone number. Essentially anything that, uh, if your company processes any data that can be used to identify me, you are required by the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner to register uh, with them. And it's a requirement because uh, it's a, we, we know how important uh, data is in this day and age. I, I, as I have mentioned before, uh, most of the big tech companies that we know nowadays, they're just data companies and that's how profitable data is. And so it's essential for this data to be protected because of how valuable it is. And that is why it is uh, a requirement for you to register because also the detriment to the individual in case of any data breaches would be very uh, significant. So you're required to register with uh, the Office of the Digital Protection Commissioner. You're required to put in place security measures to ensure that uh, the data you process is protected. This data also has to be uh, hosted within the boundaries of Kenya. What we mean by that is, uh, let's say I use a cloud service such as, uh, I know Microsoft and AWS and Google have um, offices in Kenya. So perhaps if you uh, use them as a cloud service, this is not a challenge for you. But if you use any other cloud service provider, you, you need to ensure that they have a regional office in Kenya and that your data does not leave uh, the boundaries of this country without uh, first having notified the users and also the Office of the Digital Protection Commissioner. And so we also have a few terms uh, that are important in this context. Uh, we have a data controller and a data processor. And this is also covered by uh, the regulations published by the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. A data controller is a natural person. By natural person, we mean myself or yourself, uh, Sam. Uh, because in the legal context, we have legal person. Uh, legal person is a, an organization like AMI or cooperative bank. Yeah. So a data controller can be a natural or a legal person. And um, they determine the purpose and means of processing personal data. 
So, uh, for example, um, they, if, if let's say uh, we are talking about AMI, I don't know what data AMI collects, but within AMI, the person who determines um, how this data is going to be processed and what its purpose is, is the person who we are calling the data controller. Then the data processor is a natural or legal person, and they, their role within an organization is to process personal data on behalf of the data controller. So um, it could be someone engaged in a contract, in a, on a contractual agreement. So it could be someone who is outsourced or in-house to an organization, but their role is to process the personal data in the different ca capacities or methods that we process data. We have already talked about how AI and machine learning algorithms are being used to uh, process data and gain insights. And essentially, that is an example of, the, of what we mean by uh, processing data. Any action that you take um, to, to use this data or to apply this data that you have collected in a certain way that is beneficial to your organization, that is what we call uh, processing data. Processing, yeah. Yeah. And so um, there are also a few uh, exemptions from the mandatory registration of data controllers and data processors. And uh, the first of them is where your annual turnover is below 5 million shillings and you employ less than 10 people, you are exempt from uh, registering under the Act and the subsidiary legislation. Wait, could you say that again, please? So uh, if your annual turnover is less than 5 million shillings and you employ less than 10 people, you're not required by the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner to register as a data processor and data controller or data controller. So, However, there are usually some uh, purposes. If you're processing data for certain purposes, despite falling below the, the stated term of 5 million shillings and employing, 10 million shillings and employing less than 10 people, there are some uh, purposes that I'll require you to be registered under the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. And uh, these are usually listed um, under the Act and subsidiary legislation. Uh, I will not go through them because the list is quite extensive, yep. but yes, yes. Uh, there are exemptions to uh, this exemption that we have mentioned about an internal of less than 5 million shillings and less than 10 people employed. But mm -hmm. the good thing is that the government is very uh, open about uh, the requirements and this information is readily available on the website of the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner, and it's presented in a very straightforward manner, so you're able to um, tell what is required of you as a business. So everything is pretty clear and straightforward. No one is trying to really, uh, it's not its not compliance by entrapment. <laughs> everything <laughs> is really available by the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. It's open sure. access information. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I know we're coming to the to the last minutes of our conversation. I'm curious. So some of us are here and we're wondering, maybe we're not at the front end of that, but I know we need compliance is important. At least if we don't understand the full picture, give us some basics for compliance. So when it comes to handling and protecting people's data that we may be collecting, what are some things that we need to put in place? Um, how should we handle that data? Talk to me like I'm a micro or small or medium-sized business. Yeah, so um, we have what we call compliance technology. So compliance technology is, is, is an up-and-coming sector that uh, deals with technology that uh, allows you to stay in compliance with any regulations that affect your industry. So we also have compliance technology that deals with uh, data privacy and security. That is one measure that organizations can take to ensure they remain compliant specifically with the data protection regulations of Kenya. Uh, so compliance tech is, is also readily available as the same way you would buy any other software. And I know there are a lot of companies in Kenya dealing with uh, privacy compliance technology. And it's one measure that you can put in place to ensure you remain compliant with the regulations, especially it's especially beneficial where perhaps you do not have uh, a dedicated legal team to tell you that there have been these changes to the law and this is how you need to comply. So compliance tech will assist you a lot with that. Um, another thing that uh, we have to keep in mind, uh, especially when building our software systems, uh, is what we call privacy by design. 
So privacy by design means that uh, when we are building our applications, uh, we are ensuring that uh, we are building them in such a way that privacy comes in, comes into the design process. We're designing our applications to ensure that uh, privacy is inbuilt. It's not, it, it's not coming in with secondary consideration where you, you built this uh, wonderful application, but then uh, at the end of the process is where you realize, oh, I need to incorporate data privacy into my application or into my business process, whatever it may be. We need to design our business processes and our software applications around uh, data privacy. And that is what we mean by privacy by design. Um, another thing that we need to take into consideration is what we call fair information practices. So fair information practices essentially refers to principles um, that include uh, transparency, uh, informed consent, individual participation, purpose specification, uh, data minimization, security and accountability, essentially what, what we talked about before when we were dealing with ethical challenges. So yeah. fair information practices uh, involves taking into account the ethical challenges that we mentioned before, the ethical challenge of data, challenges in data privacy, and ensuring that um, we incorporate or rather we take steps to mitigate these ethical challenges from the outset. So whatever business we are doing and uh, whatever data we're collecting, we ensure that we, we take into account this fair information, these principles of fair information practices, which as I have mentioned are related to the ethical challenges that I mentioned before. And finally, uh, we have something called privacy impact assessment. So um, an impact assessment is an assessment that you take to evaluate the potential impact of a project on an individual's privacy. So whatever business I am undertaking and whatever personal data I intend to collect, I need to understand what is the impact, potential impact of this process on an individual's privacy. Uh, what consequences are they going to suffer if in the worst case scenario, something bad happens if there's a data breach. So you need to do a privacy impact assessment for any new system or business process that you're introducing. Uh, we also have accountability. Accountability is, is more or less, um, I'm sure we know what accountability is, but we need to put in place measures internally in our organization to ensure that there is accountability for any data breaches that occur. So we need to understand uh, where did this problem arise, who was involved, or what technology was involved, or what exactly failed, what exactly happened that led to this uh, data breaches when, if and when they occur, and what can we do to ensure that it doesn't happen again? And that is one, what we mean by accountability. So yeah, I think um, that's essentially I'm, I'm, short of it. yeah. Thank you very much. I think maybe the last two questions I have, or maybe this can be brief. When you work with uh, small and medium-sized companies, and we're talking mm -hmm. of course, the whole conversation around um, data security, cyber security, it's a big one. When you're, when you're working with small and medium-sized companies, what are the common challenges that they are expressing to you? Um, the first one is usually understanding what what the first, what all the fuss is about. <laughs> what's, what's the first yeah. about data, <laughs> yeah. data and, and, and privacy? Why is it suddenly such a big thing? And I think from this conversation, you've seen how valuable data is in today's yeah. digital environment. And so we try okay. to educate small and medium enterprises on uh, the value and the importance of data and also how consequential data breaches are to the privacy of an individual. And these are rights that are guaranteed not only by, uh, by statute, but also uh, by our constitution. And so uh, you can see that uh, if we are not taking data privacy seriously, uh, we are violating constitutionally guaranteed rights of an individual, and that is a very serious there are, offense. There are, there are penalties so, for this. Yes, there are penalties for this. And so um, it's also a challenge for a lot of small and medium enterprises to establish data ethics framework, and that we assist them a lot with coming up with a data uh, privacy and ethical framework that will guide the organization, not only uh, in the present, but also in the future. We try to align uh, data ethics frameworks with the organization's strategic plan 
to ensure that uh, these ethical frameworks are forward looking and they are able to benefit you five or 10 years into the future. Another challenge that we've also seen for SMEs is uh, education and training of personnel. Um, because for a lot of SMEs, we usually see a high turnover in, in terms of uh, the employees who are working at the company. Um, there's usually a high turnover of employees, which is, I guess, I guess is a common thing for small and medium enterprises. So yeah. it's usually a challenge every time you have to bring in someone to come and train you. What I would advise is you need to put in place a, a training manual. Uh, if, if you understand your business completely and you understand where the risks fall and how you process data and essentially your entire data processing process, it's possible to put in place a universal training framework that can be used to train anyone who comes into the organization at any point in time. So you do not have to keep calling professionals like myself every single time you have employee turnover to come and train you. It's possible to put in place um, training materials that uh, you can use uh, even years into the future without having to be involved, especially for myself. Then you've touched on privacy by design and by default. Uh, and I think I don't need to go through that again. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious on, uh, you mentioned trends. Well, there's a question. Um, what digital trends or technologies are concerning you most when it comes to this topic of data security and cyber security? I think I am most concerned with um, AI and blockchain technology. Um, with AI, it's because of the very large number of um, Data. It's very voluminous data that, that, that is collected and it's a lot of personal data. Sometimes you may have interacted with a website 10 years ago and you're not even aware and they collect that data and they use it uh, to build a profile about you. And, and so it's very concerning because really, uh, but it's a good thing that governments are now taking seriously uh, AI regulation. I think we've seen a proposed act of parliament in the United States there's also been one in Spain, and I'm sure Kenya is going to catch up very soon. But governments yeah. are realizing how important it is to regulate um, the AI sector in terms of data privacy. With blockchain technology, my concern lies more on the side of uh, fraudulent activities. I think the blockchain sector is really facing a difficult uh, point, point in history because there's a lot of fraud going around with uh, the blockchain sector. Which is... Which is ironic because the, the, the ideal around blockchain is the security. That's what they sell exactly. the most, right? It's, it's very ironic, so, yeah. yeah. I think we know the case of, uh, is his name SBF or something? The, the guy from the United States who conned a lot of people uh, with uh, his crypto bank or something of the sort. And you, you, you know, when these cases of fraud come up, you usually ask yourself, how secure is the data that you shared right. to these blockchain right. networks? Yeah, and I think yeah. that's the biggest concern right now with blockchain technology. Yeah, especially, I guess, that's a big concern, and I guess we have to be concerned about that as businesses and as individuals, because over time, our even our money is going to just be zeros and ones in, in on a screen. It's not going to be physical. Yeah. So to think, to think that someone can uh, just hack and change those seven figures to six figures is a bit scary. Uh, do we have legal okay. frameworks on blockchain in Kenya? Uh, not yet. I think that people, these sectors are usually uh, are, are being discussed at the moment and companies are exploring, uh, sorry, not companies, but rather institutions are exploring different ways to push for policies, uh, policies at the government level that either regulate these industries or provide guidance on how uh, these industries are going to be operational in Kenya. I do know that there's an association of blockchain technology in Kenya. I'm not sure exactly what the name is. And I know they've been taking steps to uh, engage the government on uh, the regulation of the sector. But as of now, the what we rely on in terms of uh, regulating these sectors is the Data Privacy Act that we have yeah. spoken about before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, um, I guess two other things. The last one I'm going to ask you is, it sounds like there's a lot to learn. <laughs> We're talking already way more than, of course, we can cover in this short time. 
but talking AI, ethics, uh, data privacy, regulation, future trends, how do I keep up to date? What's your source of information that you go to so we can, I guess, run there as well? Um, the internet is a very good resource, which you just have that's to be the, That's the problem. Yeah, what you just have to be careful about is you, you have to interrogate what you're reading. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, especially with personal blogs, there's a lot of misguidance that comes with uh, interacting with personal blogs. Yeah, Nelson, which, would, which sources of information do you recommend? <laughs> what I would advise is uh, media houses. But okay. even with media houses, you have to be careful and see whether it's an opinion <laughs> or whether, because especially in the West, in, in, in yeah. the global West, we have a lot of people who write articles. Propaganda. In, yeah, they've been established media houses and what they usually write is just, it's an opinion. And if you don't see that it's an opinion, you will be scared to think that it's the official position of uh, the media house and you might take it as true. When in fact, it's just someone yeah. who's been paid uh, to push a certain yeah. agenda. To market that, yeah. Yeah, so you just I have guess, to interrogate I, whatever I guess, Nelson, Nelson, you've answered like a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, like, it's, it's difficult to tell It's like just, difficult to recommend, just be careful. <laughs> yeah, just be careful, just interrogate. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Well, Nelson, um, we have like one last minute and then we'll transition towards the landing of this. I want to share, Nelson has been very kind to share his contacts and I want to share those on the screen. Uh, just give me a second. Um, there's obviously so much to learn and Nelson has been very generous with his time. He has been generous with his uh, information and all his learning. He is the founder and CEO of two companies that work in legal and also technology. And he has this term called legal technology, which is brilliant. So legal technology is Kenna. His number is on the screen. His email is on the screen. Nelson, what would be your parting shots to all the SMEs here? Uh, my parting shot would be that uh, let's take this issue of data privacy very seriously. It can make or break your company. Um, the biggest sector right now, as we've seen in tech, is uh, data. So if you play it right, you can make yourself into a, uh, into a very large company that is not limited just to the boundaries of Kenya. You can become a multinational, but the starting point has to be respect for uh, data privacy and data security. Fantastic. Thank you so much. A big round of applause for Nelson. Uh, thank you for giving us your time. Thank you for coming for the second time. And I'm so glad I was present to be able to be your moderator. I think I've been fitted uh, lots. I've taken lots of notes and I definitely appreciate you being here, sir. Thank you as well. It's always an honor. Thank you. All right. I see lots of applause coming through. We are finding a way to land our plane and we're going to get safely home. We have about 10 minutes. I want to... Um, maybe just if I may call on Maureen. Maureen, if there's any particular, Maureen from COP. Maureen, if there's a particular uh, aspect of COP Bank that you wanted us to highlight. But I also remember you mentioned a key award that uh, COP Bank won. Please uh, let us know what exactly, please remind us for those who may have missed it, Maureen. Um, There's an award that we, that was won in, in uh, India, did you say? Yes, yes. You can hear me, Sam? Yes, I can. Please tell us about that award and then we'll land our plane. Oh, yeah. I was saying we won an award for the best SME Financial Africa, a gold award. So it means we were the best. So we thank our customers for supporting us. And we urge you to continue partnering with us and also support us to continue giving the best to our MSMEs. I think that the clap is coming through. I hope you can hear that clap. We're definitely congratulating. Yes, uh, <laughs> thank you for the work that you're doing to support SMEs across Kenya and way, way beyond. Thank you very, very, very much. Much needed applause. Oh, and a I big applause. Thank you very much, yeah. <laughs> and a much bigger applause to all the SMEs because you are the ones that make this happen. You have the courage and you have the fortitude to keep doing what you're doing. And uh, COP, I know, is only here to assist you meet those goals. So thank you so much for being with us as well. Now, I want us to take the next few minutes uh, onto our feedback poll. How has today's experience been before we drop off? Uh, please let me know. Uh, 
Give us your comment. Give us your comment about the speaker. Did you feel today's session was interactive? Did you learn something? How applicable was this for your session? For your for, was this session for your business? Give us some feedback there. And then uh, in the next few minutes, we'll land our plane and allow you to pick up on all the business that you have been working on. I'll be quiet in the background so you can um, uh, respond to that. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your quick response. Very good. I'm just going to see. And if you have any comment that you wanted to add to, to today's discussion, you're more than welcome to do that. Now, for those who are wondering, how do I access this recording? If I missed a bit, I know someone was already asking for some of the notes. In case you are taking notes and you want to share those, how do I make sure I catch up on this session? Um, If you absolutely enjoyed Nelson's being here and you're like, oh, I need to catch up with the first session he came in with. Well, that's also on the platform. Now I want to take the next few minutes as you finish on the poll. For those who are keen to, to jump into the session, uh, go ahead and look at the screen. It will show you how you can get to the web portal. So you can go to Google, like most, uh, most of us, or you can use the link that is going to be posted in the chat. Just click on it. And as soon as you get to that, just click on Knowledge Hub and then webinars. So once you're on the website, Knowledge Hub, webinar. And once you, oh, sorry about that. Once you click on Knowledge Hub and webinars, then it will just show you the host of all the sessions that we've had in the past. Okay, and it's been close to a year now, so there's lots of sessions, fantastic sessions like this with people such as Nelson, um, who are subject matter experts and what they do in different aspects. And they've been giving up their time and we appreciate them. All right. Now, a quick reminder for those, um, I guess, of course, we this is to let you know this, the plane is full. Um, the plane was already full, so the, no one else is getting onto that plane. But we wanted to remind you of the trip that's uh, happening uh, for those who are going to be traveling to Vietnam and Malaysia. It's a business trip courtesy of COP and uh, just putting, COP has been organizing it. So, of course, there's been a fee to it and so on but particularly in the areas of uh, the textile, if you're into textile and garments, leather and footwear, furniture markets, electronics, if you're interested in that kind of space, uh, the uh, flight will be this Saturday. This is just to remind you about what you're missing out on in case especially you're just seeing this, but also to remind you that these trips, this is not the last one. So the another one will be coming through very soon and you'll be hearing about that here and also on the website and on all the other platforms. So next time, if you're interested in this, next time be keen to jump on as soon as possible before the plane is full. Okay, so that's that. And I wanted to just go ahead and do a bit of a call to action. Please visit the branch. If you have any challenges, if you have any information you need from Pop Bank, if you want to have a conversation about your financing needs, like uh, Maureen was sharing with us, Maybe I'll share that screen again about some of the needs. But also, if you want to visit the portal, look at the chat. You should find the link there right now. That will lead you to the Knowledge uh, Webinar portals. Okay? So that should be quite uh, available for you. And then lastly, if you have uh, a need to reach out to Corp Bank, please reach out. The numbers are on the screen. There's a phone number. There's a contact center number. There's an email, there's a WhatsApp chat that you can uh, join in and, and have conversations around any needs that you may have. There's lots of ways to reach out to COP. So if you have a need, COP is here for you. And we just want to say thank you for being here today. And then lastly, if you have something to add to these sessions, an idea that you'd like us to explore, well, reach out to Fiona Maina. Um, this is her number on the screen. And this is her email, Fiona at AfricanManagers.org. Otherwise, for today, I wanted to say a big thank you for being here. Um, thank, a big thank you to our guests. Uh, fantastic. It was very insightful, and we definitely appreciate you being here a second time. And so this is say thank you for being here today for everyone. See you next Thursday, 11 a.m. But before we go, like you know, we always like to do, we like to end with a prayer. 
And I'm going to hand back to Maureen. Maureen, who prayed for us as we started, I think it would be quite suitable for you to pray for us and then we close the meeting. Maureen, would you switch on your video and your audio? Say that prayer and then we'll bring this to a close. Uh, thank you, Sam. You can see me? Yes, perfectly. Ah, good. Thank you. Um, we, we shall pray. And before then, I just want to thank each and every. Maureen, are you still there? Uh, we'll bless your businesses and they'll be fruitful. Let us. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we come before a successful mm -hmm. wedding. And we want to thank you even for our speakers, for the day, for the partners, and each and every person who you have given us to speak to us. You can hear me? Yes, I can. Please go on. Hello, Sam. Please go on. I can hear you. Please pray. Sorry. Uh, we ask you, Father, to be with us. Bless our businesses. May you make them fruitful for ourselves, for our children, for even to share with others, Lord. We thank you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Please put an amen in the sorry chat. For and the... Sorry for that. Uh, someone told me no. uh, not audible. Sorry. No problem, no problem. Thank you so much, Maureen. Uh, put an amen in the chat and then we are free to drop off. Otherwise, God bless you and may God bless your business. Again, a big, big thank you to Nelson Curry for joining us today as our guest speaker. Thank you and God bless you. Bye-bye.